Good evening. My name is Charles Cole. I'm co-chair of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. It's a privilege. Uh, the other co-chair should be here in the front row, uh, Mrs. Sheila Riggs. She does a great job, so I'm sure she'll be coming in uh, momentarily. This is a uh, unique evening for a lot of reasons. Uh, our wonderful executive uh, director, Mr. Frank Bird, tells me we now have over 2,000 members. We're the sixth uh, largest council in the United States, and uh, on average, uh, we have an attendance over 400. As you can see tonight, uh, we're in a, a different location because of the wonderful turnout. This is also a unique occasion because this is the 10th uh, annual meeting of this particular panel with the uh, Sun Papers on foreign policy, and I would therefore want to take this uh, opportunity to uh, compliment uh, Reg Murphy, the chief executive of the Baltimore Sun. I always have an awkward uh, moment on this next uh, item. The council has a program where you can endow certain evenings, and uh, First Maryland Bank Corp and the First National Bank of Maryland has selected this evening so happens I'm the chief executive of those corporations, so we're delighted to be involved. And uh, <laughs> now, this evening, the uh, panel is obviously going to devote its energies to foreign policy and what's happening in the world today, in a very changing world. And the moderator, you're all very familiar with, he's really kind of a household name in Maryland today. Uh, Mr. Stern, Mr. Joseph Stern, has been with the paper for many years. He's traveled the world uh, on a number of occasions, and he's obviously highly knowledgeable in the area of foreign policy. And once again, we have with us again Mr. Charles W. Courtry, who all of you know spends a lot of time in Washington and appears frequently on Washington Week in Review. In addition to that, Stephen Browning is back again with us, and uh, he has traveled and lived in, in many important cities like Moscow and Lisbon and, and Paris and probably other places that I have not been uh, brought up to speed on. But clearly, uh, these are exciting times. I've spent a little bit of uh, time recently in the airplane, which uh, gives you a chance to do some extra reading. And one of the more recent uh, books that I went through was uh, Megatrends 2000. That's Mr. Nesbitt's latest book. And there's a lot in there which really ties into what we're going to be talking about this evening, which is a changing world and really the globalization of many a different economies and the expression, of course, of the individual and uh, all that that really implies. So without further to do, I do want to stress, and I've been encouraged by our executive director to say to everybody, please confine your questions to the foreign policy area. That would be very much appreciated. So, Mr. Joe Stern, um, the rest of the evening is yours. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. As many of you in this room will recall, last year at this time, we accurately predicted uh, that the Solidarity government would take over in Warsaw, that the Berlin Wall would come down, <laughs> that that there would be a revolution uh, uh, in Romania ending with the execution of Ceausescu. Uh, we missed this, Bulgaria. Uh, this, uh, this year, uh, in line with that great tradition, uh, I would like to uh, predict without fear of contradiction that we're going to have a congressional election in this country <laughs> in which foreign policy will be a very peripheral issue and will be treated unrealistically. Uh, uh, before I turn this over to my colleagues, uh, uh, Charlie mentioned that he had read a book recently. I'm now in the process of reading a, a book uh, on the French Revolution called Citizens, and I came across a quote that I just had to pass on to this audience uh, as we start to address the revolutionary events taking place in Europe. And this is from uh, Mirabeau, uh, shortly before uh, he died and was sent to the Pantheon and was later disinterred and thrown in the gutter. But he said, people have been promised more than can be promised. 
They have been given hopes that will be impossible to realize. They have been allowed to shake off a yoke which will be impossible to restore. And even if there should be fine retrenchments and economies, the expenses of the new regime will actually be heavier than the old. And in the last analysis, the people will judge the revolution by this fact alone. Does it take more or less money? Are they better off? Do they have more work? And is that work better paid? I think we ought to keep that in mind as we watch this revolution unfold before our eyes exactly 200 years after Mirabeau was speaking. Our first uh, analysis is going to come uh, from our diplomatic correspondent, Steve Brony, tonight. Thank you, Joe. I'd like to review uh, in some detail some of the things that have happened uh, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union over the last year, which have presented particular challenges to uh, American foreign policy makers and to, to us. Uh, first of all, it's probably useful to remember that for, the past, for most of the past half century, Eastern Europe was considered a block. This is a place that was untouchable, the untouchable preserve of the Soviet Union. In case there were any doubts, in 1953, Soviet troops intervened in, 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 in East Germany to, to, to put down a popular uprising there and to protect the communist leadership in East Germany. In 1956, Soviet troops, accompanied by other Warsaw Pact allies, moved into Hungary to suppress uh, tendencies toward independence and, and neutralism there. 1968, uh, the, the, the same scenario with some differences was repeated in Czechoslovakia where Alexander Dubček's uh, Prague Spring, communism with a human, socialism with a human face was put down, Dubček was overthrown. In the early 1980s when solidarity was getting a foothold in Gdansk and Szczecin and other industrial centers in Poland, there was a danger of still another Soviet intervention in Poland which would have been reminiscent is now useful to recall of Russian imperial interventions in Poland in 1831 and in 1863. So with that as a background, I think it would be interesting to go over the calendar in some detail of what happened in Eastern Europe in the past year and some of the things that happened in the Soviet Union. A year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, on January 18th in Poland, the Communist Party adopts a resolution calling for the legalization of solidarity. This is almost a decade after it was banned and some of its leadership was put in jail. On February 6th, the roundtable discussions between solidarity, the church, and the communist-run government begin in Poland. In Hungary, on the 11th of February, the Central Committee approves the creation of independent political parties. In Czechoslovakia, however, on the 21st, a playwright by the name of Václav Havel is sentenced to nine months in prison for his part in a, in, a, in a demonstration in the previous month having to do with human rights. Then in March in Hungary, upwards of 80,000 people on the 15th of March demonstrate to commemorate the anniversary of the Hungarian uprising in 1848 against Austrian rule. The following year, it must be recalled, Russian troops intervened for the same purpose in 1849. On March 17th of last year, Hungary signs a UN refugee protocol agreeing not to return refugees against their will. This will have consequences farther down the road during the years we'll see. On April the 7th in Poland, the communist government in solidarity signed an agreement legalizing the free trade union. Elections are set for a new parliament in June. These historic agreements are concluded with private Soviet support and encouragement. In May, on May the 2nd, the Hungarian border police and soldiers begin tearing down the barbed wire that separates Hungary from Austria. On May the 8th, the Communist Party Central Committee forces former party leader Janusz Kadar into retirement. In Czechoslovakia, on May the 17th, Havel, the Czech playwright, remember, is released from prison on parole. On June the 4th, Polish Communist Party is humiliated in the country's first free elections in the post-war period. Candidates backed by solidarity win all 161 seats allotted to it in the lower house of parliament and 99 of 100 seats in the Senate. July 19th in Poland, parliament elects General Wojciech Jaruzelski as president. He's the former army, army commander in chief and the former head of the Polish Communist Party. 
he's elected with a bare minority of votes in the Polish parliament. On August 7th in Poland, Lech Walesa, the head of Solidarity, moves toward an alliance with two minor political parties to form a government, rejecting a call for a coalition with the communists. In Czechoslovakia on August 21st, about 3,000 demonstrators gather in Prague to mark the anniversary of the Soviet, <coughs> Soviet intervention of Czechoslovakia in 1968, when the Brezhnev Doctrine was applied to prevent political liberalization in a Warsaw Pact country. Security police this time arrest 370 demonstrators. In Poland on the 24th, Solidarity Advisor Tadeusz Mazowiecki, who's a former journalist, by the way, is confirmed as Poland's prime minister. This represents the first democratic transfer of power in history away from communist rule. In September in Hungary on the 10th, Hungary opens its border with Austria to, to East Germans seeking to flee their homeland. <coughs> Hungary, by doing this, abrogates a 1968 agreement with East Berlin <coughs> by which they commit themselves to block travel to a third country in the West by any East Germans desiring to leave their country. In the ensuing days, thousands of East Germans leave Hungary for West Germany by way of Austria. It is the biggest East German exodus to the West since the Berlin Wall was built in 1961. September 19th in Hungary, the government and opposition parties agree to create a multi-party political system in 1990, this year. In East Germany, however, on September 30th, more than 17,000 East German refugees emigrate to West Germany from Czechoslovakia and Poland with the permission of an embarrassed East German government. Then East Germany temporarily closes its border with Czechoslovakia, hoping by that to prevent a further hemorrhage of people. In October, on the 7th, the Hungarian Communist Party abandons Leninism and renames itself the Hungarian Socialist Party the first time a ruling Communist Party renounces its fundamental ideology. In East Germany, the same day, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev is cheered by the East Germans in East Berlin, where he is visiting to commemorate the German Democratic Republic's 40th anniversary. The cheers for Gorbachev show popular support for reform, which is denied them by the, by the hardline Communist leadership in East Germany. Gorbachev privately tells the East German party leadership that it is out of step. On the 9th, two days later, 70,000 people demonstrate in Leipzig, East Germany's second city, challenging Communist Party rule. East German party leader Erich Honecker, the hardliner, orders marchers stopped by security police by force if necessary, but the security forces refuse to intervene. On the 16th, a week later, some 100,000 people join a pro-democracy -democ march in Leipzig, the largest unauthorized demonstration in East Germany since 1953 when Soviet troops intervened. On the 18th, two days later, Honecker is replaced as East German party leader by Egon Krenz. In Czechoslovakia on the 28th, riot police use clubs to break up a pro-democracy protest in Prague. So we're seeing an uneven progress here toward, toward democracy, toward democratic institutions away from... Yes, ma'am. On the 9th of November, a date that will live in history, the Berlin Wall is open to East Germans as part of a set of limited reforms that the new party leadership hopes to use to calm unrest. Bulgaria, which has been spared change until now, on the 10th of November, ousts Todor Zhivkov, who has been party chief and president in Bulgaria for 35 years. November 20th, after several smaller demonstrations in Prague, more than 200,000 demonstrated in the Czech capital in favor of free elections and the replacement of hardline communist leaders. Large protests are staged in other cities. On the 24th, four days later, Communist Party General Secretary Milos Yakish and other leaders resign. Alexander Dubček, the former party leader in disgrace, whose reforms incited the 1968 invasion, addresses a quarter million demonstrators in the capital city. In Romania, finally, Nicolae Ceausescu, who has run Romania as a personal fiefdom, is re-elected president without opposition. He rejects any ideas of democratic reform. In Czechoslovakia, on the 27th of November, millions of Czechoslovak workers conduct a two-hour general strike in support of democracy. The following day, the government abandons a provision ensuring the leading role of the Communist Party in Czechoslovakian politics. On the 30th, the government announces an end to travel restrictions to the West and says it will dismantle fortifications along its border with Austria. December 1st, East Germany. The East German parliament votes to end the party's guaranteed monopoly of power. 
On the third, Egon Krentz, East German party leader for only 44 days, resigns, along with members of the Politburo and the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Six days later, Gregor Gysi, a lawyer who has defended dissidents in East Germany, succeeds Krentz as the country's Communist Party leader. Bulgaria, on December 10th and 11th, Bulgaria's reform leadership proposes free elections for June 1990 and proposes removing a constitutional provision that guarantees Communist Party domination of the country's political life. In Romania, from the 15th to the 22nd of December, there was unrest and turmoil in Timisoara and Bucharest and other cities where security forces loyal to Ceausescu kill hundreds of people. The army eventually joins the protesters and overthrows the government. Ceausescu and his wife attempt to flee but are captured. The Ceausescus are tried before a military tribunal and are executed. In Czechoslovakia on the December 28th, Dubček is elected chairman of Czechoslovakia's Federal Assembly. The following day, Václav Havel, remember him, the playwright who was arrested as the year began, becomes Czechoslovakia's first non-communist president in more than four decades. On January 13th, a few days ago, in Romania, the government sets a referendum on outlawing the Communist Party. Indeed, these are momentous changes. They're happening so rapidly that governments and certainly journalists are overwhelmed by, some, by the pace of events. During all this, Lawrence Eagleberger, who's a deputy secretary of state, a former associate of uh, Henry Kissinger, um, number two man in the State Department now, delivered a speech in which he talked about the stability that accompanied the, the old Cold War, the old bipolar world where NATO and, and Warsaw Pact forces were frozen in, a, in confrontation, where nothing really changed, with, but it was stable. He just mentioned it was stable. He didn't defend it, but then someone accused him of being nostalgic for the Cold War in the midst of all these changes. About a week later, Eagleburger made a speech to a, a group in Washington and recalled that he'd been accused of being nostalgic for the Cold War, and he, he cited some of the changes, some of the rapid changes that, 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 that he had to deal with, so some of the things that I mentioned here. And he said, nostalgic for the Cold War? My God, I'm nostalgic for last week. <laughs> <laughs> so having to deal with, with East Germany, East, Eastern Europe, was only one of the problems that, that the administration and its foreign policy advisors and policymakers had to confront. The primary problem behind all this were the changes that were going on in the Soviet Union and the kind of leadership in the Soviet Union which allowed these changes to take place without intervening as earlier leaderships had and as earlier czars and emperors had. When the Bush administration came to office about a year ago, there was a sense in, among some of the president's advisors and certainly among some of those, some of those in the State Department that President Reagan the beloved President Reagan, had been propelled into a period, new period of detente by a sentimental judgment that Mikhail Gorbachev was a personable fellow, that he was unlike any of the Russian leaders I have known, Reagan said, of the only Russian leader he had ever known. Certainly, Gorbachev had agreed to a historic treaty eliminating a whole class of nu nuclear missiles and did so largely on American terms. But would Gorbachev last? Was the reform drive that he led durable? Or as Brent Skokoff, the president's national security advisor, persistently asked, were the reforms reversible? Could all this be undone? If they were, what would be the consequences? of Gorbachev's replacement by a more traditional, conservative, if not confrontational, Soviet leadership? What if that leadership, or Gorbachev himself, decided suddenly to rearm after another treaty or two that reduced nuclear and conventional weapons? Skokoff and others, concerned that if this were the case, the United States would be reluctant to match a new Soviet buildup with all the problems that would cause, urged caution. Reagan's policy, in any case, had been a series of ad hoc decisions without any genuine coherence and with a great deal of disorder within his administration. President Bush wanted a durable policy, one that would survive the latest Gorbachev concession. He ordered an extended policy review that not surprisingly reflected the caution of the president and the people around him. The result was something that was called status quo plus. In other words, what we've been doing before with a little new wrinkle. 
Unanswered still was the question that many of the president's advisors thought crucial, and that was, is Gorbachev for real? That's the way they put it, is Gorbachev for real? With that question unanswered, the administration was slow to engage the Kremlin reformer. The United States was willing to give Gorbachev's rhetorical support for perestroika, his reform program, but not much more. Meantime, during last year, U.S. intelligence was able to confirm that President, Gorbachev's, that President Gorbachev was keeping his promise for unilateral reductions of 500,000 men and 10,000 tanks from the Red Army. And it was evident that there was increased Soviet tolerance for the changes in Eastern Europe, which we just discussed, which, a tolerance which surpassed all expectations. At the same time, Secretary Baker and his top advisors we're coming to two important conclusions about Gorbachev. The first was that Gorbachev's political position was secure in the Kremlin due to the fact that there were really no alternatives. There, were strong, there was a strong consensus in the Politburo and the Central Committee in support of the need for restructuring because of the dire problems the Soviet Union faced economically, socially, and otherwise, and the fact that the conservatives, who had misgivings to say the least, had no credible program, had no credible alternative, had no credible spokesman to challenge Gorbachev. The second assumption, the second conclusion that Baker and his people made was that even if Gorbachev was replaced, it would be unlikely that agreements reached with him by the United States on such things as arms reductions would be reversed by any of his successors. So that instead of holding back and waiting for proof of Gorbachev's good, good faith, or the probable success of his reforms, the United States should conclude as soon as, soon as feasible mutually advantageous arms control and other treaties with the Soviets to lock them in as much as possible. This is an important development in administration thinking about how to deal with the Soviets. But the watershed was probably Baker's meeting with Foreign Minister, Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze last September in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Baker became convinced during this very intense discussions that he had with, with Shevardnadze, that he could do business with him, and that Gorbachev was a genuine reformer, and that he was not the drugstore cowboy that Marlon Fitzwater, the president's spokesman, had loosely described in one day. So at the end of this unusually productive meeting in Jackson Hole, which set the stage for the Malta Summit Conference in December, Secretary Baker said that U.S.-Soviet relations had moved from confrontation to dialogue to cooperation, a far cry from the depths of the Cold War. The Secretary of State followed up the Jackson Hole meeting with two important speeches, one declaring that the superpowers should find enduring points of mutual advantage, as he described them, and the other speech saying that the United States, which had, that the administ U.S. administration, which had been criticized for its timidity, for its reluctance to engage Gorbachev, should not pass up the opportunity the Soviet leader offered. And I quote, any uncertainty about the fate of reform in the Soviet Union, he said, is all the more reason, not less, for us to seize the present opportunity. For the works of our labor, a diminished Soviet threat and effectively verifiable agreements can endure even if perestroika does not. This stood earlier administration policy on its head. This was followed up by the Malta summit last month, where President Bush assured General Secretary Gorbachev the United States would not take advantage of Soviet internal problems by inciting restless national minorities to challenge Soviet rule, nor would Washington exploit Soviet weakness in Eastern Europe. The spirit of Malta was quickly put to the test when Secretary Baker made a quick unannounced visit to East Berlin for the purpose of bolstering the position of Communist Party reform Prime Minister Hans Modrow. The position of Communist Party, a visit he decided to make at the last minute. When Baker did this, he extended the courtesy of, of sending a cable to the General Secretary in Moscow informing him that, that he was going to visit East Berlin, which would be the first visit by an American Secretary of State to the capital of East Germany. And he explained to the Soviets what his intentions were and that they were to bolster the regime in East Germany to help keep it in place until 
the scheduled elections could be held on May the 6th. Both the Soviets and the Americans feared, feared increasing disorder in East Germany that could lead to unpredictable consequences. The second consequence, the second interesting development that followed Malta and the sort of understanding that was reached there is evident in the last few days. When the US administration openly expressed its understanding under the Baker Doctrine for the central government's use of force in Azerbaijan to quell violence involving two antagonistic nationalities, the Azeris and the Armenians. The United States, in doing so, made an important distinction between the such, use, such a use of force, which it considered legitimate, and the repression of political dissent or attempts at peaceful change in Soviet internal arrangements. Just the other day, on the 22nd, two days ago, State Department spokeswoman Margaret Tutwiler, reading from guidance prepared by policymakers on the, on the seventh floor, made this very important statement, condoning, in effect, for the first time in, in history, the use of Soviet force internally to restore order, use of Soviet force against a minority, use of Soviet force at all. She said, reading, in part here, violence by some militants gave rise to events that created a need for force to restore order. There is a fundamental difference, she said, between the short-term use of force to restore order and the use of force to suppress peaceful and legitimate, and legitimate political expression. This is quite a new development, bearing out, bearing out the uh, the promises made by President Bush to General Secretary and President Gorbachev at Malta, that the United States would do whatever it could as long as its values permitted them to help at some distance, at long range, sustain the reform movement and leadership position of General Secretary Gorbachev within the Soviet Union. All right, these are, these are just some of the challenges that have, that, have, uh, that have faced American policymakers, and there are certainly risks that arise from, from, from these changes that, that perhaps we could discuss later. Uh, one or two other things I wanted to mention, and that is that the administration's approach to the Middle East, which has always been a graveyard of diplomatic ambition for everybody involved there. Secretary Baker has taken a fairly low-key approach trying to draw one more time, the Egyptians, Palestinians, and Israelis into negotiations uh, on some arrangement that could uh, lead to an accommodation between Israel and its Arab neighbors and also with its Palestinian population. Uh, another development certainly worth mentioning is the uh, tragic and dramatic events in China, in Tiananmen Square, last June, where Hopes, world hopes for similar reforms that had taken place in other communist regimes were brutally and tragically dashed in a matter of hours there. Uh, the administration's response, dictated largely by the president and not by the secretary of state in this case, were that no matter what happened there, the United States has interests in retaining China, if not a friend, at least on in a cordial relationship because of China's immense economic, political, and uh, military weight in the world balance. So to the disgruntlement of Congress and probably the American public, uh, President Bush sent on one secret mission, General Scowcroft and Deputy Secretary of State Eagleburger, shortly after these events when he had announced publicly that no such thing could take place. And then again recently, uh, less secretive, he sent the same two men to uh, attempt to compose U.S. differences with China in the aftermath of these uh, terrible events. Thank you. Uh, Charles, it's yours. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you folks again. Uh, after the tour of the horizon, as I warned Joe in advance, I thought I would talk a little bit about the little picture. Um, as Steve has pointed out, in the, on November 9th, the 
sections of the wall began to come down because people were chopping away at it and uh, the gates were opened. Uh, what had happened in East Berlin well, was simply that Egon Krenz, who had taken over the government when Honecker fell, had no concept of what he wanted to do. He had a great deal of heat on him from the streets, and so in an effort to gain some credibility, he opened the wall. Uh, this was disclosed when a reporter asked his spokesman at a press conference, when uh, do you plan to relax travel restrictions or something to that effect? And the answer was, well, we're going to let people go through the wall whenever they want to. They hadn't even notified the cops. So the uh, people poured into West Berlin on a night that you all saw many times on television repeatedly. Um, I had been, and I want to talk just a little personally, if I may, about uh, the uh, situation in Berlin. And then, uh, uh, if I'm cunning enough, I'll switch on to uh, the defense program. I don't know whether I can bring that off or not. I'm going to try. But the, um, I had been in Berlin before there was a wall many times. Uh, I was there when they built it. Uh, and I was there as recently la as last April when Honecker was toughening up. The last person shot had uh, been shot on February 5th. And so I had to go back and have a look, and I was there at the end of November and in early December. And at that time, about 300,000 people were coming into West Berlin every day except on weekends, and then it was a million each day. The Kurfürstendamm, which is one of the world's most glamorous streets, a two-mile boulevard of shops and restaurants and hotels and theaters, uh, was a curious mixture uh, of well-to-do West Berliners and, uh, let's face it, rather shabbily attired East Berliners uh, gazing into windows at things they couldn't afford. Um, they came over in tr what was called the invasion of the Trabis. The Trabi is an East German car which is made of plastic and with a lawnmower engine. And these were mixing it up with the Mercedes and the Kurfürstendamm in sort of a metaphor for what the East Germans hoped was going to come about, that is to say, unification. Um, I called on the spokesman for the mayor of West Berlin, um, and I think that th this was one of the most interesting revelations, really. At that time, as you will recall, toward the end of November, there was a great deal of chatter about unification of the two Germanys. But there I found a man who was letting those romantics in Bonn have it. He said, they talk about unification here in West Berlin, which is run by a different political party, of course, from West Germany, uh, than is in Bonn. Uh, here in West Berlin, we've got practical problems. Two million people in West Berlin were playing host to one million East Berliners and East Germans, and this was getting to be a bit much. Uh, free transportation, uh, an effort to locate housing for the refugees, giving everybody 100 marks to spend when it came through the wall, um, building roads, repairing bridges at the wall. Yeah, they were rather desperate there, and they, as I say, they said they had desperate uh, <laughs> had their own practical problems. Um, the former mayor of West Berlin, on the other hand, a man named Diepkin, uh, confided to me that the present government didn't know what it was doing, was trying to turn Berlin into a village, and what was really needed was unification now and to restore the great glory of Berlin as a cultural center, etc. Um, I went over into East Berlin to call on a couple of communist gentlemen who had been in the mainstream in, or at least in, 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 in the life of East Germany for about 40 years. And uh, this involved going through Checkpoint Charlie, which is, as you know, the part of Berlin and the Friedrichstrasse where foreigners enter, uh, go back and forth. I'd done this many times before in tour buses or in military cars, but this time I walked. It took an hour to get through because of the crowds going through. When you went, you had to exchange one Deutschmark for one East German mark. Uh, you had to exchange 25 at one for one. 
And uh, I'll tell you, in, in the game is you're supposed to spend that money. Now, a Deutsche Mark is worth, during those days, it was worth up to 20 times what an East Mark was, but you exchanged them one for one. And when I left at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, the guard asked me, the East German guard asked me if I had currency of the country. And uh, he, I said, yes, I have 25 marks. He says, what? Do you? I said, well, I can say no if you prefer. But it, uh, uh, because it was that kind of situation, and this is so strikingly different. Um, he says, don't you know you're violating the laws of our country? And his eyes twinkled, and I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, whatever I said. But uh, the point is, he then said, well, go ahead and please spend it next time you come, will you? <laughs> so this is the kind of change that's going on there. Um, I spoke uh, with these uh, two people that I mentioned. One had been a diplomat until he made the mistake of complaining about how much money a uh, member of the State Council had spent for personal enjoyment in Amsterdam. Uh, that converted him into a non-person briefly. Uh, another was a filmmaker a documentary filmmaker who had had uh, his time in non-personhood as well because he had suggested honesty in films instead of the kind of stuff they were turning out because when people looked at the films they knew perfectly well this isn't really what it was like in uh, in East Berlin or in East Germany. Um, but these two uh, quite agreed that the situation in East Germany was unsolvable and in the danger of economic collapse was very much there. Uh, the filmmaker had high hopes that they might still uh, pull it off. After all, the land of Marx and Engels ought to be able to uh, create a good socialistic state, whereas the diplomat uh, simply said that he'd waited 40 years for utopia, and that was quite long enough. And um, so, they agreed that they didn't particularly care for reunification of Germany at this time themselves, uh, but that the impetus for reunification of Germany, or unification as many people prefer, um, was coming from East Germany, from, these, uh, from the agenda that was being set in the streets. And I found agreement with that on the west side of the uh, wall as well, that the impetus was coming from East Germany. They wanted, they wanted action now. Um, they want economic reform before they have economic collapse. Now, economic reform is a nice term. Uh, price reform is another nice term. I thought I might suggest to you something of what, is, uh, what that would mean. In East Germany today, where people eat subsidized food, it costs one mark 80 pfennigs to produce a loaf of bread. The government sells it for 52 pfennigs. That is to say, it sells it for a little more than half a mark. Uh, you question how long, I don't know how they've been able to go on this long at that. Uh, another um, example, if you raise tomatoes in East Germany, you take them to the government, to the state stores, and you sell them for five marks a kilo. The government thereupon sells them to consumers for two marks. Before long, it seems to me, it would be much smarter to go to the government store and buy a kilo of tomatoes for two marks and sell them back to the government for five, a lot easier than raising them. <laughs> and this is the kind of situation that, that one finds in the East. About a third of the state budget is used to subsidize consumption, uh, to subsidize basic stuff. So reform, if and when it comes, is going to do what's fairly obvious to you. It's going to put an awful lot of people out of work because they're going to be paid on the basis of performance. It's going to cause prices to be a lot higher than they are so that things are, uh, they charge what they're worth. And uh, rents, of course, are subsidized and they're going to go up. All this is being tried, I think, in Poland. and. Uh, I don't, I, and now the hope is, expectation is it will have to be tried in East Germany. Um, there's another thing I discovered, and that is people are very clever when the wall came down. There always are such clever people at making money out of a bad situation or a joyous situation, as you may choose to regard it. In East Berlin, you can buy a bottle of vodka for 17 East Marks. So you buy a bottle of vodka for 17 East Marks and you make your way through the wall to West Berlin 
and you sell the bottle of vodka, of vodka for seven marks. Seven Deutsche Marks are worth 70 East Marks. So you then have converted your 17 into 70 East Marks. You can buy four or five bottles of vodka and you go back through the wall. Pretty soon you're a vodka millionaire. As was suggested to me by one of these communist people whose wife immediately interjected, yes, but you're a millionaire in East Marks, as if to say, so what? Um, now, um, the communists are still running East Germany, and from what we read, hope to continue in power. Uh, apparently, they've had a rough go at trying to maintain the security police. Uh, the people gather in Leipzig once a week still and complain, and um, the problem is that there is a terribly disorganized opposition in East Germany at this time. And they have a short while until May uh, to, to produce a program and uh, have a go at uh, public office. It is also a case, the case that there are going to be elections in West Germany this year too. So Germany is going to be very interesting uh, for people who happen to be interested in public affairs or follow the news. Uh, on, um, I, I happened to be there at the time on November 29th when Chancellor Kohl made his speech that was widely regarded here as pushing unification of Germany uh, rather faster than the Western Allies and the Soviet Union wanted. Um, it seemed to people in Germany that he was really trying to seize the political initiative because he had been regarded in much the same way that President Bush had been regarded back here, a little slow to react to events in the East. And so uh, he probably will be reelected, by the way. Uh, he, w he was trying to get the high ground there. And he was also, in my judgment, trying to take some of the fever out of the unification uh, demands because he laid out a program of political and economic framework in which the unity of Germany could be brought about, but could be brought about gradually in, in an orderly manner, and there certainly uh, without any time being set. The um, military situation in the East is uh, fascinating. When I say in the East, I refer to the Warsaw Pact states that have broken away uh, militarily in practical effect from the Warsaw Pact. But what has happened now is the Soviet Union has lost control of the national armies, the armies of the East European states, which previously the Soviet military high command could order into action without ever referring the matter to the state capitals, to the, to the uh, civil authorities of the other countries in the pact. Excuse me. Now, the, the point there is that one can quite easily see, as will be argued in Washington next week, uh, that the threat of war has vastly diminished if it hasn't disappeared in Europe. And in political terms, that's perfectly obvious. The Soviet Union hasn't any intention any, or any will, I would think, for war in Europe or anywhere else, given the plight the Soviet Union is in. But it has also a diminished capability. It has um, not much reduced its own power. I, I, I'm not arguing with the point Steve made. Yes, they're carrying out their reductions. Uh, but after all, uh, they had so much stuff to begin with, it would take them a long, long time to get down to where the Allies are in Europe. But they, they've not vastly reduced their power in Europe but what has happened is that there is no chance at this time, given the crack up of the Warsaw Pact armies, their uh, total lack of any interest at all in being a part of a, a German attack on, uh, a Russian attack on Western Europe. Um, the, the warning time has, has uh, gone out. I, I've, I've heard estimates that it would take months. And if we didn't detect a mobilization in the East, then our whole intelligence community would have to be sacked because it would take a very long time. So what has happened is the warning time has increased. 
the capability has gone down some and the political interest has disappeared. So the, the chance of war, I think, um, is, is, is vastly diminished. And if, Joe, have I run out of time yet? Would you like me to? Uh, 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 <laughs> the, um, that, that, that sort of gets me on to the uh, defense matter, which will, the budget will go along with the rest of the federal budget to uh, the Congress next, um, uh, on January 29th. Uh, the, it comes at a time when you're seeing a interesting convergence of interest between the two superpowers, something people used to laugh at the prospect of. But it, it, there are converging interests. They want to maintain the two alliances to manage relations between East and West and manage a drawdown of military forces when the treaty finally is negotiated. Um, there's a convergence of interest between the United States and Soviet Union, in my judgment, on whether there should be re reunification of Germany. Uh, I think both would like to make that uh, a long time down the road. Um, and certainly on arms control. So there will be a volatile situation for a while, I would think, in Europe, but uh, not, not one that threatens war. So what do you do if you are the Secretary of Defense uh, facing the prospects that Congress will rip your budget apart uh, in any case? So uh, we're, we're going to come into a time when the, the, the management of the reduction of our military forces had better be very, very wisely uh, handled. I think that the first thing that we might notice when that budget goes to Congress next week is that there is a disconnect between what the President will say his reduction goal is and the actual uh, outlook for the forces themselves. What I mean is this. I think Mr. Bush will forecast a reduction of 2% a year for five years, but that the forces planned uh, would cost rather more than that. And the reason for this disconnect is that it was only in October that the administration began the review that was an imperative one uh, based on all the facts you heard Steve recite. Um, and there is no way a gigantic machine like the American Defense Forces or military forces can be rapidly reduced. Uh, so, as I say, I think you will get promises of 2% uh, cut a year, but that the cuts will not be visible to the members of Congress and so the danger or the possibility or whatever the word might be is that they will decide to do it for themselves. The committee of 535 might, uh, you might not expect the best defense force to come out of that, but that is a possibility. Um, the other possibility is that the administration may get its defense reductions in hand by, uh, by June and that that would be in time to uh, work a deal with Congress, but I would not bet 50 cents uh, on that. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, return to the United States for a moment and, and, and try to talk about what these enormous events mean for our country. It seems to me that what they mean is that the strength of a nation, the security of a nation, is not measured in tanks and guns and bombs and ships. That it's, that it's measured in the economic strength of the country, in the educated level of the country, in its mastery of technology and its management of its economy. And although uh, uh, Americans, I think, have had a rather smug year for the past 12 months in watching the unraveling of the Soviet bloc. I think maybe it would be a good idea if uh, we cut down a little bit of the smugness and started to see where our relative position in the world is leading. Now, vis-a-vis -vis other nations, it's true that the Soviet power has dropped precipitously. And therefore, the Soviet threat to this country has dropped precipitously.
but it seems to me that as we measure our strength against uh, other capitalist systems and the way they manage these systems, there is very little room for any joy. Uh, instead, we, we see a situation where uh, the United States is losing control of vital world industries, industries that directly affect what we used to think of in the narrow sense of national security, and by that I mean the semiconductor industry, which has fallen very much towards, uh, uh, into the hands of, of Japan. I'm thinking in terms of, of our trade position vis-a-vis -vis what is happening in uh, uh, the European community. I'm thinking in terms of the fact that the living standards of Americans as we project them during the next few years are not going to be keeping pace with those uh, in Japan, the Pacific Rim, or in the European community. So that when we assess these wonderful events, and they are wonderful, that are happening in the spread of democracy elsewhere, nevertheless, I think what we need to do is say, what can we learn from these events? What can we learn from these events in the shaping of our own economy, in the management of our productive system, so as to uh, make sure that the United States, at least in a world where power is measured more by economic strength than uh, guns and tanks and planes, uh, will measure up and provide a leading role in the world. Yes, we do have the largest economy in the world. But just think that last year, Japan, a country with one half of our population, invested more in plant and equipment than we did. Think of the fact that last year, Japan's savings rate was 18% and ours was 5.5%. Think of the fact that Japan in the last year became uh, solidified its position as the as the world's greatest uh, financial power, a power that can determine the course of Wall Street and the health of an enormous number of American industries. Uh, so that we come down to the fact that maybe, maybe the chief foreign policy issue in this country happens to be the chief domestic issue in this country, which is the size of the deficit. This happens to be a grossly undertaxed country. And because we have chosen to be undertaxed, and because we have chosen to live by the credit card and on the dole, we have become hostage to, to foreign capital that can very much uh, determine the future of this country. Uh, I'd like to read a couple things to reinforce the points I've been trying to make. One comes from an MIT study, which by the way, found that our management techniques in this country are largely responsible for, for the relative decline in the efficiency of American industry vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And the MIT study concluded because political and military power depend ultimately on economic vitality. Weaknesses in the U.S. production system raise doubts about the nation's ability to retain its interest and standing in the world at large. The highest priority of U.S. economic policy must be to reduce the huge federal budget deficit which saps the savings from which investment funds are drawn. Every penny, every penny that we go into debt is one penny less that, is, that could be invested in American industry. And we ought to think about that in realizing that the deficit is the greatest threat to the future well-being. I think future well-being might be a better term than future security of the American people. And I'd like to make a few, uh, get a few quotes from some of the uh, uh, favorite uh, America bashers in Japan these days. This is from Akio Morita, the chairman of Sony. He says, there are a few things in the U.S. that the Japanese want to buy, but there are many things in Japan that Americans want to buy. This is the root of the trade imbalance. 
And when people forget how to produce goods, and that appears to be the case in America, they will not be able to supply themselves with even their most basic needs. Now let's, let's, let's turn this on to defense itself, and this time I want to refer to the notorious Shintaro Ish Ishihara, uh, who co-authored with Marita the famous book, The Japan That Can Say No. And he says, Japan, he's, he is a great admirer of Minoru Genda, who play on the Pearl Harbor attack. And he quotes him as saying, Japan will be all right. It's able to defend itself. Japan's technology can be the basis for Japan's defense. How? Referring to the US and the Soviet Union, he writes, no matter how much they continue military expansion, that's the US and the Soviet Union, no matter how much they continue military expansion, if Japan stopped selling them chips, there would be nothing more they could do. If, for example, Japan sold chips to the Soviet Union and stopped selling them to the US, this would upset the entire military balance. Japan's technology has advanced so much that Americans get hysterical. An indication of the tremendous value of that card, perhaps our ace. My frustration comes, stems from the fact that Japan has not utilized that card in the area of international relations. Uh, this is a Japanese talking. Now let's see, let's see what, what uh, uh, Michael Chinworth, a research at MIT's Japan and Science Technology has to say. He says, if you knew how many of the chips in the F-16 and in our other advanced weapons come from abroad, you would be terrified. The Pentagon's Defense Science Board reported recently that Japan is more advanced than the United States in six critical technologies, including robotics and microelectronics, and of course, in the vital uh, semiconductor field, where, where we've had to step in to stop them from uh, buying uh, Fairchild, where we've had to stop them from buying one of the key co U.S. companies that uh, uh, is involved in, in our uh, uh, production of microchips. I, I hate to... I hate to sound such a, such a somber note when we, this is a year of celebration of the American position in foreign policy. But I can't help feeling that if this country does not do something about the deficit, if we can't get rid of the phony economics coming out of the White House and out of the mouth of Patrick Moynihan, we're going to get nowhere. Because if we don't reduce our deficit, this country's position in the world is going to decline.